Solar Eclipse 2017. Everything you always wanted to know about eclipses but were afraid to ask. Hopefully at some point in your education you learned that the Sun is considerably bigger than the Moon. But how much bigger? Two times? Ten times? Fifteen times? Believe it or not, the Sun is approximately 400 times larger than the Moon. Here's what the Moon and Sun would look like if they were placed side by side. Having trouble seeing the Moon? Let's zoom in. So, if the Sun is 400 times bigger than the Moon, why do they appear roughly the same size in the sky? That's because the Sun is, on average, about 400 times farther away from the Earth than the Moon is. The hypothetical Sun in this diagram is only 10 times bigger than this Moon, and it has been placed 10 times farther away from the Earth. But it illustrates this point. Note how the images of the Moon and Sun would both occupy the same angle in the eye of a viewer on the Earth's surface. That is, they have the same angular diameter and would therefore appear to be the same size to that viewer. And by the way, drawing this figure to actual scale, 400 to 1, would have made it very hard to see in the confines of this computer screen. So for the rest of this intro, we'll stick with this 10 to 1 Sun to Moon scale. And by the way, along with the sizes and distances of everything being adjusted to show up well on the screen, the angular diameter is also quite a bit off. Each angle below, shown below is about 13 degrees. How, much, uh, how big do you think the Sun and Moon's actual angular diameter really is? It's only about 0.5 degrees. That's what 0.5 looks like. This surprises most people. Picture the Moon, for example, in the sky. Ask yourself how many moons you think it would, would need to be strung together to reach from one horizon to the other, like that, and so on, all the way to the eastern horizon behind you. Does it surprise you the answer is about 360 moons? Anyway, as you can see above, an angle of 0.5 degrees is, some, is really small and hard to see. So again, for the rest of the show, we'll go back to using that exaggerated 13 degree angle. You probably know that a solar eclipse occurs when the Moon passes between the Earth and Sun. But why is this such a rare event? And why is it seen in such a limited area on the Earth's surface? For example, the last time a total eclipse occurred in St. Louis was 575 years ago, on July 7, 1442. Of course, St. Louis didn't exist until 1765, but the inspiring event was probably witnessed back then by a few thousand members of the Illini tribe. To really understand a total eclipse, it's best to focus on the umbra, shadow that the moon casts, and on something called the penumbra. Penumbra means next to the shadow. So imagine if you were at point A, outside the penumbra, looking up what would you see? You'd see the full sun and with the sky so bright you probably wouldn't even notice the new moon beneath it. Now imagine if you're at point B barely outside the penumbra what would you see? Again you'd still see the full sun just like on a normal day. And if you were looking up from point C well inside the penumbra what would you see? You would see a partial eclipse the top portion of the Sun with a bottom bite blocked out. And what if you were at point D, just barely outside the umbra? What would you see? This time you would see a 99% eclipse with just a crescent-shaped sliver of the Sun visible. Finally, what if you were looking up from point E, inside the umbra? What would you see? Now you'd see the total eclipse. But you're probably thinking, so what? So the sun gets blocked out. What's the big deal? For one thing, the sky gets completely dark in the middle of the day. That's weird. And if it's clear, the planets and stars will become visible. Some animals get confused. Birds and dogs start acting funny. But the really special thing is that the blocked out sun doesn't look just like that. It looks like this. Most people do not know that our Sun has a huge glowing atmosphere around it, known as a corona. It's there all the time, just as the stars and planets are, but when the Sun's out, 
Usually the sky is way too bright to ever see it. The corona is only visible during total eclipses. And sometimes faint colors can be seen in it. Faint green, which is caused by an Fe13 positive ions, and reddish hues emitted by helium-1 positive ions. Chemists discovered long ago that the distinct colors of light given off by energized atoms can be used to identify the elements in a material. There are some examples. In fact, helium was first discovered in 1868 by a scientist looking at the corona of a total eclipse and seeing a specific yellow color that no element at the time was known to give off. The name helium comes from the Greek god of the sun, Helios. Helium was discovered on the sun 27 years before it was found here on Earth. Another special feature of total eclipses occurs just before totality, and then again just after. You would think that the crescent shape would appear like this, but depending on the conditions, the crescent shape often looks like this. These little spots of light are known as Bailey's beads because they look like bright beads on a necklace. Can you figure out what causes them? They are caused by the mountains and craters on the moon's surface. Light passes through in some places and gets blocked in others. Also, you may have noticed on a regular non-eclipse day that shadows cast by the sun onto a distant surface can be quite blurry. That's because the sun is not a point source and light sort of leaks around the edges of objects. Like that. During partial eclipses, especially approaching totality, shadows become much sharper. With so much of the light blocked out, the sun behaves more like a point source. So you get much sharper shadows during partial eclipses. One more special effect that sometimes occurs in the seconds just before and just after total eclipses is a phenomenon known as shadow bands. Have you ever noticed how stars shimmer in the night sky? That's the result of the light being bent, that means refracted, by interstellar gases in the space between those stars and the Earth. We say the space is a, is a vacuum, but that's not completely true. Some gases do exist out there. If these shimmering stars were close enough and bright enough to cast shadows on the Earth, then those shadows would appear like wavy bands racing across and snaking across our planet. Again, because an almost completely eclipsed st sun starts to behave like a point source of light, it has sometimes been known to cast such shadow bands on white surfaces. These shadow bands are hard to capture in photographs or videos, but here is one from a 2001 eclipse in southern Africa. And here is a video loop that sort of captures the effect. So why are total eclipses so rare? Actually they're not. On average they occur somewhere on Earth every 18 months or so. That's about six or seven total eclipses every decade. But these eclipses occur along very narrow strips, several thousand miles long, but often only 50 to 100 miles wide. And these narrow strips often fall on oceans where no one sees them. Recall that about 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, or on very remote uninhabited regions of the planet. One fantastic website you will want to visit is given to you right there. If you go there, you will see a chart that looks like this. It breaks up each century into 20-year intervals. If you click on one of these intervals, it opens up a map of the world showing all the solar eclipses that occurred or will occur in the future during that interval. Clicking on 1981 to 2000, for example, the map looks like this. Note the blue stripes mark the paths of total eclipses and the red stripes are annular eclipses, which will be explained shortly. If you count them, you would see that this 20-year period from 1981 to 2000 has 13 total eclipses and 12 annual eclipses. This is pretty typical for a 20-year span and it's consistent with total eclipses occurring about every 18 months. Annual eclipses also occur about every 18 months. And here's what the 2001 to 2020 looks like. Note how similar it is in appearance to the previous 20-year interval. Any 20-year interval you look at will look pretty much like this. This interval has 12 total eclipses and 14 annular, and one hybrid eclipse, which will also be explained later. And this total eclipse right here is what all the fuss is about. One thing that is rather unique about this eclipse, it cuts across the entire country, but doesn't touch any other country. For this reason, it has been dubbed the All-American Eclipse. 
One more thing you certainly, no, um, you certainly notice is that the eclipse paths are generally much wider in the polar regions. Can you figure out why that is? It's more or less the same reason you cast a much longer shadow late in the afternoon than you do in the middle of the day. Consider how narrow the path is when it hits near the equator. As the moon races across the sky, its shadow would leave a rather narrow path. But when the moon's shadow hits the earth near one of the poles, the path of the shadow would be considerably wider. But also notice that even within those paths that hit near the middle latitudes, that's near the equator, there is still quite a range of widths. Why is that? That has to do with the fact that the moon's orbit around the earth is not a perfectly circular one. The moon follows a slightly elliptical orbit. At its nearest point, we'll call it P, called the perigee, it's about 363,000 kilometers from Earth. At its farthest point, A, called the apogee, it is about 405,000 kilometers away. When the moon is closer to the Earth, the path of its shadow will be wider. Also, the duration of the total eclipse will be longer, sometimes up to six or seven minutes. When the moon is farther away, the shadow path is narrower and the duration of totality is shorter, sometimes only a few seconds. But when the moon is even farther away, something very different happens. When the moon is that far away from the Earth, its, annu its angular diameter is smaller than that of the sun's. So instead of a total eclipse like this, what occurs is a partial eclipse like this. The moon blocks out all but the outer rim of the sun. These are called annular eclipses. Annular comes from the Latin word annulus, meaning ring. And they can be impressive. But since the sun is never completely blocked, the sky never gets dark as night, and so the corona is never visible. By the way, Recall the names mentioned earlier for the parts of the shadow, the umbra and the penumbra. This new area that causes an annular eclipse is called the antumbra. Just thought you'd want to know. A close-up of one of the 20-year intervals shows an unusual eclipse uh, that occurred in December of 1908. Recall that blue stripes represent total eclipses and red stripes represent annular ones, but notice how this eclipse changes from annular to total and then back to annular. This is called a hybrid eclipse. A hybrid eclipse occurs when the sun, when the moon is just at the transition distance between causing an annual, annual eclipse and a total eclipse. As the moon's shadow passes across the Earth's surface, The curvature of the Earth shortens that distance and causes the eclipse to change from annular to total and then back to annular. Let's watch that again. See how the Earth's surface starts out in the antumbra causing an annular eclipse? But the Earth's surface rises up to the umbra and causes a total eclipse for a while. And then the Earth's surface falls away and ends up back in the antumbra turn the eclipse back into an annular one. Of course, one of the most impressive things about eclipses is that they're so predictable. Astronomers have, through meticulous research, obtained such precise information about the rotational speeds of the Earth, the angle, angle of tilt of the Earth's, ac Earth's axis, the duration of the Earth's revolution about the Sun, and the Moon's revolution about the Earth, and the angular tilt of the Moon's orbit, that a mathematical model can be used to predict the exact eclipse times way into the future. Though none of you will be around to witness it, perhaps 39 generations from now, your descendants might be around to witness some great eclipses hitting North America in the late 30th century. Look at all those blue bands crossing Northern America. Take this one on September 17th, 2992. If you were to Google Eclipse of 2992, this website comes up. There's an eclipse that won't happen for a long time and all there's information about it. Open up that site and this map shows up. 
zoom in on Missouri and see that although it misses St. Louis, it passes right through Kansas City. Zoom in further and then click on any spot and you get the precise start and stop times of the total eclipse to the tenth of a second. For example, this tells us that on September 17, 2992, at precisely 339.17.5 p.m., a total eclipse will just be reaching the 50-yard line of Arrowhead Stadium and it will last 4 minutes 11.3 seconds. That's pretty impressive. So why every 18 months for total eclipses? The moon orbits the Earth every 27.3 days, but because the Earth has moved a little in that time, the moon has to go a little more than once around the Earth for the Earth, moon, and sun to line up. That's why the lunar cycle lasts about 29.5 days. Since 365 divided by 29.5 is 12.4, you would expect the moon to pass between the Earth and sun about every 12 times a year, or once a month. This view is looking down on the north pole of the Earth. First, the Earth is rotating on its axis counterclockwise, and the moon is orbiting the Earth counterclockwise, as the Earth orbits the sun also counterclockwise. These black wedges represent the shadows that would fall across the Earth during eclipses, total, annular, or hybrid. And you can see they occur about every month, or you would think they would. So why do we not get 12 such eclipses each year? We would have an eclipse at 12 times a year if the moon's orbit around the Earth and the Earth's orbit around the Sun both existed in the same plane, like that. But they don't. The moon's orbit is tilted by about 5 degrees. So more often than not, the shadow of the moon misses the Earth. Sometimes it passes over the North Pole. Other times of year it passes under the South Pole. Recall that the Earth makes one complete trip around the Sun each year. Only when the Earth, Moon, and Sun are lined up and the Moon is in the same plane as the Earth's orbit can an eclipse occur. That can happen only here and here. These points are referred to as nodes. And as you can see in the diagram below, these nodes occur each time the Earth revolves around about halfway around the Sun. In other words, about every six months. But only about a quarter, 26.7%, of these are total eclipses, 33.2% are annular, and 353 are partial eclipses. The remaining 4.8% are hybrid eclipses. Just a quick review of these four eclipse types. Partial eclipse, when portions of the Earth's surface end up in the penumbra of the Moon's shadow, that's 35.3%, Total eclipses, when portions of the Earth's surface end up in the umbra of the Moon's shadow, that accounts for 26.7%. Annular eclipses, when portions of the Earth's surface end up in the antumbra of the Moon's shadow. Hybrid eclipses, when the Earth's surface starts in the antumbra, but then rises up into the umbra due to the curvature uh, of the Earth. And that accounts for 4.8%. Keep in mind that during total eclipses, annual eclipses, and hybrid eclipses, very small portions of the Earth's surface experience the effect, usually less than 0.01%. But during all those eclipses, huge portions, sometimes over 30% of the Earth's surface experience partial eclipses to varying degrees depending on how far away the location is from the eclipse path. So if you look at all that region that falls in the gray, that's experiencing partial eclipses while those narrow bands are experiencing the other types. To dramatize this point, consider the partial eclipse views the rest of North America will be experiencing as the August 21st total eclipse just passes over Nashville. So really all over Canada and the United States you'll be seeing partial eclipses um, for those two and a half minutes that the moon shadow passes over Nashville. Here's a sort of eclipse calendar that shows all the eclipses that will occur worldwide for the next six years. Notice how they come in cycles about every six months. 
Here's the All-American Eclipse in August of this year. Here's an annular eclipse that occurred last February in the South Atlantic. In 2018, there will be three partial eclipses, but no total eclipses or annular ones anywhere on Earth. And here is the next total eclipse that will occur on July 2nd, 2019. It will pass over the South Pacific and remote areas in Chile and Argentina. It's that one right there. By the way, all these red ones represent lunar eclipses, partial and total. A lunar eclipse occurs when the Earth casts its shadow on the Moon. Lunar eclipses are fairly common. In fact, one occurred about two weeks ago, and they last for several hours. Compared to solar eclipses, lunar eclipses are, well, rather boring. So back to solar eclipses. One thing that makes total solar eclipses so special is that they're so brief. Even though the shadow may be 50 to 150 miles in diameter, it passes by in just a few minutes. This is a result of how fast the moon's shadow moves. The August 21st eclipse will travel roughly 10,000 miles in a little over three hours. That's averaging about 3,000 miles per hour. That'd be 5,000 kilometers per hour. But the shadow is not traveling at a constant speed. At the beginning and end of its path, the shadow is moving up close to 5,000 miles per hour. But in the middle, over the central U.S., it's only traveling about 1,500 miles per hour. Can you figure out why this happens? The moon is traveling at a fairly constant speed, so why isn't its shadow? Hint, just like the explanation for the hybrid eclipse, the answer lies in the fact that the Earth's surface is curved. The shadow is actually moving at a fairly constant 1,500 miles per hour relative to a fixed spot on the Earth's surface. But watch how it fast it appears to be moving at the beginning and end. Watch this again, focusing just on where the shadow hits the Earth's surface. See how fast the shadow moves at the beginning and end of the path? The shadow is moving about 1,500 miles per hour, and that is pretty much reflected in its speed across the center of its path. But the moon casting that shadow travels around the Earth at a speed of about 2,300 miles per hour. How can the moon be moving at 2,300 miles per hour, but its shadow appears to be moving at only 1,500 miles per hour? The moon is moving at 2,300 miles per hour, and so its shadow must also be moving at 2,300 miles per hour. The Earth, however, is rotating on its axis at a velocity of about 800 miles per hour in the same direction. Thus, the speed of the shadow relative to the Earth's surface is 2,300 minus 800, which is 1,500 miles per hour. To better illustrate this, consider the dots below. They represent 500 mile segments, blue dots as fixed points above the Earth, and red dots as points on the Earth's surface. As the black bar, that's the, man, the moon's shadow, passes by, try counting 1, 2, 3 for each of the blue dots it passes. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Then try counting for each of the red dots. So ready? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this is the 1,500 miles per hour um, shadow speed that we will be experiencing here in the U.S. Slower than 2,300 miles per hour, but still very fast. By the way, if the Earth were spinning in the opposite direction, but everything else remained the same in terms of their orbits and rotations, then instead of subtracting the two velocities, we would be adding them. Instead of an apparent shadow speed of 1,500 miles per hour, it would be more like 2,300 plus 800, 3,100 miles per hour, and that means eclipses would be lasting only about half as long as they do. So why are eclipses so dangerous to look at? With 99% of the light being blocked out, shouldn't a partial eclipse be less dangerous to look at than the full sun on a normal day? The truth is, looking directly at the sun on any given day is, bad, is a bad idea. But we and other animals have acquired, through evolution, protective behaviors that help us avoid this risk. Our pupils quickly dilate, and that is, they get smaller. We squint. 
we instinctively turn away from such a bright light source. It's easy to imagine in the evolutionary history animals that did not possess the genetic disposition for these innate reflexes. They would go blind, have trouble finding food, die out, and not pass their genes on to the next generation. It's known as natural selection. But what makes eclipses so dangerous is the fact that they are not as bright as the full sun and therefore the reflex to squint and turn away does not get triggered. A person can comfortably look at a partial eclipse for a long period of time and not feel any need to look away and not realize they are doing permanent damage to their retina. The light enters the eye, gets focused on the retina in the back of the eye and burns it. And since the retina has no pain receptors, the damage is done before the person even knows it. Of course, the only safe way to look directly at the sun for any length of time is through very dark filters. Well, there's one in every crowd. By the way, you will want to keep your eclipse glasses on all the way up to the start of the total eclipse. Then you will definitely want to take them off so you can witness the corona and the stars and everything. But then you will want to quickly put them back on before the sun peeks out after the totality is finished. In fact, a lot more damage can be done to the eye immediately after a total eclipse than can be done immediately before it. Can you think of why? Before the total eclipse, the pupil of your eye will look like it normally does during the daytime. But during the eclipse, your eye adjusts the darkness by dilating the pupil to allow more light in so you can see better. But the dilated pupil will mean your eye is especially vulnerable right after the eclipse passes. So be safe. Sorry, but we're going to end this slideshow on a sad note. Go back to the Apollo lunar missions of the late 60s and early 70s. We all know those fearless astronauts brought back all kinds of rock and soil samples from the moon. But can you think of four things they, they left there? One, their footprints. The American flag. A golf ball, that's right. And a mirror facing the Earth. Huh? That's right, a mirror, and astronomers since then have been bouncing light beams off that mirror and timing how long it takes for the reflected light to return to the Earth. That's pretty impressive when you think about it. But here's the sad news. They have discovered that the moon in its orbit is very gradually drifting away from the Earth. It amounts to about 3.8 centimeters per year. That's about an inch and a half. To put that in perspective, that's about how fast your fingernails grow. What that means is that eventually, a few billion years from now, total eclipses will become less and less common, and annular eclipses will become more frequent. This is how things are, are this is how things are now. A good mix of total and annular eclipses. But this is how it will be a few billion years from now. See how the moon's farther away? We'll get no more total eclipses. They'll all be annular ones. The end.